Star Trek books. They've been around for decades. Join us, the Trek ladies, Kavora and Jen, as we discuss the novels one at a time. Welcome to the Ladies Trek Library. Hello, and we're back with Ladies Trek Library. I'm Kavora, and this is Jen. Hi, Jen. Hey, Kavora. It's great to be back. And our book this time is Dwellers in the Crucible by Margaret Wonder Bonanno. And this book was originally published in 1985, and I'm just going to read the back cover. Warranters of the Peace, the Federation's Daring Experiment to Prevent War Among Its Members. Each warranter, a man or woman, is hostage for the government of his native world and is instantly killed if that world breaks the peace. Now Romulans have kidnapped six warranters to foment political chaos and then civil war within the Federation. Captain Kirk must send Sulu to infiltrate Romulan territory, find the hostages, and bring them back alive before the Federation self-destructs. Okay, so I have to say Sulu is not as important to the story as that made it sound. (laughs) Yeah, he's hardly but, in yeah. it at all. Yeah, which we will talk about. So, um, but more about the warranters of the peace. So the idea was that because this is sort of the idea behind the whole book, they it's these people that have a capsule in in a chamber of their heart, and the capsule has the instructions on how to have a nuclear war that that would destroy that person's planet. So each of the warranters is a representative of of someone from their their planet. And, for instance, Cleante, one of the main characters in this book, her mother is the High Commissioner of Earth. And so Cleante is a warranter. She has this capsule uh, so that her mother can can have her high position. And so if somebody were to kill Cleante and take this the capsule out of her heart, that's basically going, going to start a war. They, they can use it to start a nuclear war. Do you want to add anything to that, Jen? Um, well, I mean, it was definitely an interesting concept. I had never heard of this concept in any of the, you know, Star Trek uh, on screen universe or in any of the novels that I'd read. So this was new to me. Um, and the idea of putting uh, the the plans on how to mil- uh, build nuclear uh, weapons in a chip in a, in someone's heart so that the only way you can you can get the. Uh, you know, the instructions is to kill the person. Um, that was interesting. Um, and it made me kind of think, is this something the Federation would really do? So the, the idea was that, um, and the warranters all live in a settlement on Vulcan called Tlingshar. Um, and, you know, everyone who's got a, every person who's serving in some high role in the Federation has a family member serve as a warranter or in some cases um instead of a family member they can have someone who is like a substitute um so there's all these people living in the settlement from all over the federations who are either a family member or serving as a a, a substitute for someone who's a a high-ranking federation official and i kind of i don't know it was an interesting concept and i still really can't decide whether i think that's something the federation would really do what do you think you know, I yeah, I can't really see the Federation doing this. It yeah, it does sound almost barbaric. And the the book does say that it came from Vulcan. Well, well there were the idea that Surak had the he had the idea in his time and they decided to keep it. And it does say that the Federation only started doing this 5 years ago. So then you have to wonder, well what happened to make them start to do this? Um and, and I also read that this it, it is a real idea that someone presented to the president of the United States, but, but of course, the U.S. never did that. But that's where the author of the book got the idea, because it was something that – it was someone else's idea. And yeah. so oh, – and, and the book does say that um, – and also for, for Spock, um, Ambassador Sarek is – he is able to be an ambassador because there there is – this other Vulcan woman named Tishale, the other main character, and she is doing this in place of Spock. Like you said, they can have substitutes. So Tishale is, is doing this so that Sarek's son Spock could be free to, to be in Starfleet. 
Yeah, and so that now they did say uh, in the book that it said, I'm just quoting directly from the book here, it says, Vulcan prehistory, in Vulcan prehistory, it was custom for the firstborn of a tribal leader to dwell among a rival tribe once a truce had been declared. If the least of that tribe's members died in a renewal of hostilities, the rival chieftain's offspring was forfeit. Um, the practice kept the peace sometimes. So, and and um, actually it kind of reminded me again, uh, and I've talked about this on another book that we did. Um, I In studying Celtic history, there's also, I, I wonder if the author got that um, idea from that because that is was also a Celtic custom. Um, I don't know about the killing um, of, of the tribe uh, person, but that was a custom to send uh, a older male, uh, a, a male child to live with a, another tribe um, to, as a sort of a peace thing. Um, but then it made me think of the idea that they could have substitutes. That sort of is more of like a modern, more modern idea. Well, not totally modern, but, you know, in recent history, you, you've seen where, um, you know, sons of uh, wealthy people or, you know, high ranking politicians have been able to get out of serving in the military um, because they can sort of have substitutes. And even, you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries, we had rich men um, could, could pay someone to serve in the military for them. So that's kind of the same idea, which, yeah, I, I don't know that I can't really see the Federation doing that. But, but since that is the basis of um, what happens in the book, so it so it is something that's here. Um, so, so, and what do you think about the, like, the use of, like, Cleante and Tashale were the main characters instead of the main Star Trek characters in this book? Um, you know, I don't, I don't mind that. I, I've, I've read other books where the main characters are, um, you know, characters that the author created and not canon Star Trek characters. And in, in this author's uh, book, uh, Strangers from the Sky, uh, some of the main characters are also original characters that she created. Um, and I think that was a really good book. So I think if it's well done and the characters are interesting and it's an interesting story, I'm perfectly happy to read about, you know, original characters. Um, doesn't So what about you? I, I do like the use of the characters in this book. I mean, yeah, yeah since she, she made these original characters so interesting and they had such a rich backstory, a lot of it is um, flashbacks to how their friendship developed and everything. So it's, I mean, yeah, I, th I think it worked in this book, even though I do like to see the parts with the main characters. I, I mean, it's, let's see, I like that they, they use Savick, even though she has a small role. But I read that this is the first of the original novels that had Lieutenant Savick. And this takes place before The Wrath of Khan. And, I mean, at least it does have some appearance of them. And I, I like how... The, the use of Sulu, as as we mentioned, Sulu got to go on this secret mission, and he was disguised as a Romulan. And, and actually, now, now it would have been good to see more of him just because they put him in an interesting situation. But because of the, the nature of where the book wanted to go, they just couldn't have him in the story as much. But that would have really been cool, though, to see more of, of Sulu and what he was doing. Yeah, I agree. Um, that was a really interesting mission where Sulu gets sent uh, in disguise as a Romulan to go undercover on Romulus. Um, and they only give you little snippets of it, so you really don't get to see much at all of what he's doing there. Um, but I think that would have been a, a really interesting story about Sulu's time yes. undercover on Romulus. And then the other notable scene, because it was so funny, was Scotty. Um, and Scotty was also sent on an undercover mission, but not quite not quite the same as Sulu. But Scotty is still himself, but he went to a bar and supposedly got drunk with a Klingon. And the Klingon was Korax, whom we know from The Trouble with Tribbles. And uh, that was just a funny scene, Scotty and, and the Klingon drinking together, acting like they're buddies when they're really not. Yeah, that was an interesting use of Scotty. So his undercover mission was... For them to pretend that he had gotten kicked out of Starfleet because of bad behavior while he was drunk, um, and so then he's on, the, you know, in this bar um, and he uh, bumps into Korax and you know they they get drunk together, but really Scotty's not getting drunk. He's he's take he's taken something that uh, prevents the alcohol from really making him drunk. 
Um, so he's just, uh, you know, pretending. And, and then this is just a way to loosen up the Klingon and, and get some information out of him. And that was, that was his mission, which was kind of funny. Very different from Sulu's mission. Yes. So now we get into these. The the main part of the story is these warranters of the peace. At, at least the, six of them got kidnapped by Romulans, but the Romulans and Klingons are working together. And the prisoners get taken to this um, remote planet with, with no name and where they're they're basically um, being watched over by Klingons. And so now, first of all, it was six warranters that got kidnapped originally. And I don't think that like the book didn't say exactly how many there are, because if it's really, you know, for different races, you would think there would be more. Yeah, I wondered about that because the six warranters that got kidnapped were three Deltons, um, an Andorian, a human and a Vulcan. And so obviously there are many more planets in the Federation and uh, there must be more warranters. And so, and they, they did make it seem like the, the uh, kidnappers specifically chose them. They didn't just randomly grab some warranters. And so I kind of always wondered why did they pick those, you know, um, but there's never really any explanation as to why those six were selected. And so, um, but, but they do, all the warranters apparently live in one place, Taling Shar on Vulcan and that's also that seems kind of dangerous that they would like someone decided that all the warranters would live in the same place together. I guess they well because they figured that would be safe. But it just but you see but see now in the book like oh it's so easy for them all to be kidnapped because they're all just there together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the idea was supposed to be that you know Vulcan is such a peaceful planet and you know. Yeah. It, it's safe, um, and also it's a place where they can, like, learn together. And, but I also kind of wondered, you know, with this whole idea with the warranters, you know, let's let's say somebody is selected to be a warranter. Why do they have to go to Tling Char and stay there? I mean, why can't they just go about living their life um, wherever they, whatever planet that happens to be on until the time is up for the capsule to be removed? Uh, they didn't really explain that too well. Yeah, I, I guess I think it really is just so that they can um, all be, be protected. I think that's the idea yeah, instead of giving a, an individual bodyguard to each one. But anyway, um, so now we're going to get into more more things about the book. So I and I should make make this warning uh, to all the listeners. The book has some very adult content and it could be disturbing to to some people, especially to women. So so the book focuses on Cleante and Tashale, a human and a Vulcan. And I know it's a, what it's supposed to do is examine their relationship as a human and a Vulcan that are best friends and have such a strong friendship that they are willing to sacrifice themselves for each other. And it's supposed to be based on the Kirk Spock relationship because with Kirk and Spock you have you also have a, a human and a Vulcan who are who are best friends, who would do anything for each other. So, um, how how well do you think this was portrayed, having having the two females uh, representing Kirk and Spock? Well, you know, I could say that to Shale, you know, because Vulcans all have the logic training, that in a ways that she's similar to Spock as far as a follower of logic. So in that sense, you know, you could see her as a, as a stand-in for Spock. But Cleante was, was, is a very different person than Kirk, um, not just because she's a woman, but – and she's also very young. Um, but, but just her personality was different. So it didn't really give me the feel of, of a, what a Kirk-Spock relationship was like because the personality is so different um, and, and maybe the age – um, also, with Kirk and Spock's relationship, you know, it built up over time, having served together. Um, Cleante, in, in this situation, when Cleante and Tishael meet um, on in, in, in Pling Shar, uh, Cleante is sort of the one forcing the relationship. She wants to know more, and um, she seemed to me like a very... I mean, I know she's supposed to be a young in her early twenties, I think. Um, but she just seemed very immature. Um, 
someone who's emotional and very hot headed. Um, so it, it was a very different kind of relationship between her and to shale than between Kirk and Spock. Um, what did you think? Um, yeah, it was very different. I mean, so, and, and another big difference too, is just the fact that these women are civilians instead of being in Starfleet. Yes. So, uh, the book examines their their friendship and how it how it developed over the years. There, the the book has so many flashbacks, um, things about things that happened to the two of them on Vulcan, basically about their friendship evolving. And I thought all of those were, were great stories. It, it was fun to read about about the, the two of them and Cleante trying to um, fit in on Vulcan because you know it, they met when Cleante became a warrantor and had to go to Vulcan. And uh, learning about their culture and then to, uh, what Tashil was, was getting out of Cleante was learning more about humans. And she did seem to be interested. You know, she said, tell me about love. And and that was something that Cleante found hard to do because she's so young and she and she has she said, she you know, she's had a lot of boyfriends, but still not not exactly quite been in love enough to really be able to tell someone about it. Yeah. Um it, it was a really fascinating to read. That was my, my favorite part of the book. My favorite parts of the book was the sections, uh, the flashbacks um, with Cleante and Tichelle's life on Vulcan before they were kidnapped. Um, and it's really fascinating the the world building um, that the author has done um, in this town in Vulcan, which is known for its music and um, people who build musical instruments and, Tichelle's father was a great musician um, who has died, um, and just the the development of that, and also that the town is there's these ruins there. The descriptions of the town of Tlingshaw, Tlingshare. I'm having a hard time saying that. T apostrophe L I N G S H A R. Um, however you want to say that. Yeah, that was really fascinating. I, I think she could have made a book just talking about that world. Um, and I almost kind of wish that rather than flashbacks, I mean, maybe some people wouldn't have been as interested, but I think it might have been good to just have built that story up from the beginning and, and bring it up to the point where they get kidnapped rather than doing it as flashbacks. But um, but it really was just a, amazing world building and, and so much uh, interesting stuff in, the, in those parts. That is what I thought, too. But the, the flashbacks were... Yeah, they they were awesome. So so they were put in like in certain places because uh, both of these women have been have been kidnapped along with with some of the other warranters. And so while they're in in their in their prison, basically they you know they're both remembering these things from the past. I I think it was it was fitting the way they well to me the way the way the these flashbacks were interspersed with the what you call the story in the present, it, it worked well because they're they're examining their friendships and remembering things that happened in the past, and it kind of fits with or or it contrasts with with the 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 terror that they're that they're going through uh, being in this prison. So the the next part that we get to, I mean, so when when they are when they are kidnapped, and so so the Klingons. Are the ones that are their their overlords for this time, and so in these these very disturbing scenes, what what starts out is that the Klingon commander, his name was Kraz. There are so out of the prisoners now the the Andorian dies pretty early in the book. He gets killed in an escape attempt. So then we've got the the Vulcan and the human and the three Deltans. The Klingon Kraz has the, the three females. There's one Delton female and then Cleante and Tashel. And he he says he wants to rape one of them, basically. I mean, it's th- this is a very intense scene, and it's very scary that the three women standing there wondering who he's going to pick. And it, it doesn't happen, though, that the, the rape doesn't happen in this scene, but it does get very scary. And, it, and it's almost a setup for for some other intense parts of this book. So th- the book is really disturbing, and I was kind of surprised to, to read that in a Star Trek book. Yeah, it, it had 
and that it had some very adult themes and not just uh you know the the almost rape scene um but you know that that was disturbing um although i guess um if you think about it you know might might be realistic even though it's something that's you never really have seen on screen um but it, it also and it, it also had some other adult themes in there which was the rape scene the rape you know, I don't want to call it rape because it, it didn't happen, but the, you know, the scene where the Klingon wanted to rape one of the captives, um, you know, I could see where that fits into the story because it wants to give you the experience of the terror that it, it must have been like living for all these months in captivity for these people and the horrible things that they experienced. Um, but there was also other stuff like, especially with the Deltans, um, you know, I'll just, I guess we've, the only other book that I've really maybe seen a little bit of that in was in the novelization of the motion picture. Um, and it may be in other books that I haven't read, but I just felt that was kind of unnecessary that they, the author kept talking about the Deltons having sex all the time. <laughs> it was almost yes. Like, and, and the, I mean, and it's their culture, I guess, um, or, or what the author believes is their culture, but it's a, it's an adult uh, male and female Delton. And then a, a boy who's, I don't know, about 11 years old based on what they're saying. And they're all related and they frequently all have sex together. And the author describes this um, where, you know, the other people have to sit around and listen to it. And, even before they get kidnapped, there's a scene where they're just walking around on Vulcan where they live and they just decide to stop and the three of them have sex. And it's just, did you really need to put this in? Like, does this content have to, is this relevant to the story? Because it didn't really feel like relevant to me. It just felt like one, you know, I don't know, sort of a, something you'd see in fanfic. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So that kind of like creeped me out a bit to, to hear, you know, have those scenes. And then, of course, the rape scene was in there. Although, like I said, I think, um, you know, that that did tie into the book and that that probably was meant to show what it was like being captive. Yes, to show how, how dangerous a, a situation was that they were in. It was. It probably was realistic, but it's just that we, yeah, we're just not used to seeing that kind of thing in Star Trek, especially not in a book. I, I know I read somewhere that the Star Trek books were supposed to be aimed at somewhat younger audiences. And so, yeah, it was surprising to, to have it in this. Um, and, and as far as the Deltons, I, I mean, yes, I agree because they hit, like in Star Trek, the motion picture, well, I mean, yeah, you had Lieutenant Ilya who was a Delton, and and she was very attractive. And but but just from the movie, you you don't know about the pheromones. That that was uh, in the book for Star Trek: The Motion Picture, where they said Deltons have pheromones, and so that's how they they you know they're so they're so easily able to attract the the it's usually the opposite sex. And um, so so yeah, these three Deltons, and and it is weird. You know, for our culture to read this, like, okay, a man and woman and a child, and they're all, and the, you know, the book describes a little bit of like wrapping their legs around each other. Um, yeah. There yeah. Are so it was. When, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. There are scenes when Cleante and Tashel are, you know, they're they're all being held captive in the same room, and you know, here the three Deltons are like having sex, and Tashel and Cleante are kind of just in the room, like, okay, like. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it made it very like I maybe it was put in there to make you understand the perspective of what it would have been like for Cleante and Tashel to experience, you know, but, but I um, thought it was unnecessary. OK, well, if anyone has not read it, we, we don't mean it's not really explicit. This is not like an X-rated no. novel or anything. No. It's not it, it's not that explicit, but it's just that it's um it's in the book enough that that, you know, it's there. And the, and the book goes later on because I, I do want to examine this because it's it's such a, an important part of the book the um the the sacrifices that Cleante and Tichel make for each other they go they go pretty far in this um the Klingon Kras he he dies in an earthquake and then the next Klingon named Kalor is the one in charge now and he wants to do these experiments i mean i mean and he was a different type of klingon which is what they said on this his his father 
was exiled for for being different from other Klingons, and Kalar kind of Kalor kind of secretly supports what his father did. So he wants to do an experiment on torture, and so to shale volunteers to do it. it oh, and at, and at this point, like and. Yeah, I guess I should mention the Deltons. They they eventually die because they're basically tortured to death because for them, they have to have physical contact a lot. And I don't think it always has to be sex for them. It can just be hugging, but they do need physical contact, which seems strange when you go back to Lieutenant Ilea. How do, how do Deltons in Starfleet handle needing physical contact all the time? Uh, but anyway, um, the other Deltons are tortured to death and so it leaves Cleante and Tishale and then um so Tishale volunteers to be in this experiment with Kalor where he sends her well outside of their compound because on this planet they're 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 in a an area that's protected from the the environment so she goes outside of that area and has to live in the cold at night and build her own shelter and it gets below freezing where she could die but she does survive it for several nights and then when when Cleante finds out that that that's what she's been doing every night she tries to sacrifice herself to to save her friend from this from uh from being in the cold that could kill her so and and this is what's really disturbing and it's just such an important powerful part of the book i had to mention it Cleante offers herself to the Klingon, and so so they are they are there every night, and that and Deshell doesn't know at first that that's what's going on, but Deshell knows that she no longer has to go out in the cold, and so this is just a very disturbing part of the book. It is Cleante, you know, doing this with with the Klingon every night, and she was repulsed by the idea. She didn't want to do it, but she. She always felt that it was in danger of happening, and now she wants to do it in order to to save her friend. Did you find that as disturbing? Yes. So that whole part of the book was very disturbing, um, you know, with uh, Kalor and, you know, doing these experiments where first he does these experiments on the Deltons until they're all dead. Um, and uh, and then his experiment uh, on Tishel is, you know, he wants to see, I guess, how, um, you know, how long Vulcans can survive in the cold because, you know, they need, they're more accustomed to warmer weather than humans and Klingons, I guess. So he makes her go every night out into the freezing cold on these, on this exposed planetoid. And, um, you know, Cleante doesn't want, you know, knows that Tishale's probably going to die if she keeps, you know, if, if uh, Kaler keeps doing these experiments on her. So she, basically goes and offers herself to him and says, you know, if you stop doing this, you know, I'll, I'll have sex with you, which is what he wanted before when um, Tishal had intervened. Um, and then there's the storyline where, you know, she's going and having sex with him every night. And, you know, first she's repulsed by him, but then she sort of develops like Stockholm syndrome where she sort of starts to empathize with him and, you know, almost, I don't want to say loves him, but, but, kind of in a way loves him. Um, and it's very disturbing. Yeah, that, that part was weird too, the fact that, that the two of them, I mean, the book describes like they almost start to like each other's company, um, Cleante and the Klingon, because um, it says they, they start talking and they like hearing each other talk and because they get to talk about, you know, themselves. And yeah, it it's just very, yeah, it's very strange. Um and, and I kind of wonder too if if the author and and this you know this book has a female author. I wonder if her like idea of like maybe she was trying to tone down the the rape aspect just because because this is a Star Trek book, so maybe she was told that she couldn't make it an out and out rape scene. I mean, I, I mean I wonder if that's the reason it, it was done in this way. You mean like so maybe rather than being out and out rape scene, she's made it where it's sort of voluntary. Um, yes, it, even because, though under yeah. these you know circumstances, we couldn't really say that it that it's voluntary. I mean, it, exactly, it, yeah. So it is. Um, yeah, it's it's like it's something in the book that you, yeah, that that definitely sticks out. And um, but um, it's like. 
like, whoa, like, well, this is so shocking that they would put this in here. And so later on, um, they introduced that, like, the uh, the female Romulan commander from the Enterprise incident, she comes into this book because she's one of the Romulans involved. And, and of course, they, I mean, they make it clear that it is that same Romulan, even though she doesn't have a name. They, this book doesn't give her a name. But when she comes in and says she wants the conditions to be made better for these two prisoners, because she she thinks of them not as prisoners, but they're just they're being held because of because of different reasons, you know, political. They're like political prisoners. They're not they're not hostages. She doesn't want to think of them that way. She tries to arrange for better living conditions. She gives them hot water and uh, data chips so they have something to read. And she tries to give them you know clean clothes because they've been re- wearing filthy prison clothes for a long time. But but another interesting thing was when T- Tichelle said she didn't want to wear the new clothes. And then later on when Cle- Cleante is alone with her and she asks, why didn't you want to wear the clothes? And Tichelle says, well, well, whatever the exact words were, but it was like, do you want to wear this sexy blouse in front of the Klingons? And Cleante went, oh, yeah, I, I get it. So just another scene to show the the danger that that they were confronting. Yeah, and I, as you said, they they didn't name her, but they made it clear that it was the Klingon commander because they did have the character Tall in there, um, and, and he's mentioned. Um, and and I liked having her in in the story because she's an interesting character. But I kind of had a hard time believing. So the the way that the story goes is that. The Romulans initially kidnap these prisoners, but then, and it's a joint Romulan Klingon plot um, that's supposed to make uh, the cause turmoil within the Federation. But then the Klingons are the ones who are watching over the prisoners um, and responsible for taking care of them. And you know, they their their conditions are pretty terrible. Um, and then when the uh, Actually, even before the female Romulan commander comes, some other Romulans come and they report about the the terrible situation, that the, you know, the condition that the, the hostages are being held in, and you know recommend making improvements. And I I kind of was like, uh, do, you, do you really think the Romulans treat their hostages so much better than the Klingons? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Romulans don't have a reputation for like having nice conditions for their prisoners. <laughs> so it was kind of hard to believe the Romulans come in and were like, yeah, you know, you need to make things nice for the prisoners. Um, so, and I almost saw it as, I mean, she was almost being a mother figure. Um, you know, you know, she was the, the older Romulan and, and maybe it was, it had something to do with the fact that these two prisoners were women, maybe, but just the fact that she wanted them to be taken care of better. Well, she had ulterior motives. And I don't she know, did, can we, yeah. Can we talk about that now? Yes. So, and I, you know, her ulterior motive didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but um, I, I guess her ulterior motive was supposed to be that she wanted to show Spock that she is an honorable, uh, that she has honor where she feels that Spock does not because, you know, Spock betrayed her and tricked her um, and she wants to, show him that, hey, she's an honorable person. So she, and an honorable person would make sure that the hostages are are being taken care of. Um, And she actually ends up eventually being the one responsible for for saving their lives and making sure that they get released. Um, And her whole reason for doing this is is supposedly that, um, you know, that Tishale let Spock know that she's responsible so that he knows she's honorable. And I thought, well, I don't know if I can really buy that that's her motive for getting involved. But Yeah, that was different. I mean, I guess every book that has her has to has to say that because, I mean, the, this Romulan commander has been in several Star Trek novels um, and, and in some of the fan films. She, she always remembers Spock, of course, but they act like. Like like he's just always on her mind and and like he's the motivation for her to do everything she does. Yeah, and that's a little hard to believe. I mean, and in this story, there was something a little more realistic is you know is that she actually had a a relationship, a long term relationship with uh, her sub commander Tall. Um, but he knew that you know Spock is really the one that she really loves um, and not him, and he's just you know. Uh, is it believable? I mean, maybe. Um, 
maybe she harbors a pining for Spock, someone she met a, for a very brief period of time. Yes. <laughs> but, but I mean, I liked, I liked her, I like her character. So, and I like seeing her in the story, but I don't know that it, it, it made sense having her in here. And so that brings us to the next thing um, about how well this fits into canon. I mean, that I like how there were a lot of um, characters that, that we've seen before. Such, I mean, I, I do, you know, I like seeing the Ron Commander and Tal and the fact that it had Delton's. And the fact that they, like they mentioned, um, Ambassador Shraz that was in Journey to Babel, the Andorian warrantor was actually the, the son of Shraz. He was the warrantor for uh, for Shraz. I mean, I, just, I like it that they throw these things in. And one other thing, too, was that the Pawn Far, so the book has the Pawn Far again. Um, to shale while she is a prisoner, starts going through the Pawn Far. So she has this strong urge to, to be with the uh, the person that she was bonded to as a child. And, you know, that's something that the Pawn Far always seems to get in the way of Vulcans, doesn't it? It's like they they can't travel because they always have to go back home at a certain time to be with their with the one they're bonded with. Yeah, I mean, and so in this case, it, it made it seem like she was experiencing Pon Far because uh, the the man that she was bonded to, Stalik, uh, he was actually going through it. And so through her connection with him was the reason that she was experiencing this. Um, and of course, you know, I, I, they don't say her age, but um, I, I would say they made it seem like she was probably in her 40s at least. Um, but of course, conveniently... Um, you know, as soon as she gets kidnapped <laughs> is when yes. her her bonded mate goes through Pot Far and she's not around. So Yeah, that's what I mean. It's just it's yeah, the whole idea of Pon Far has always been inconvenient. <laughs> it you know, it never happens at a good time. You, you we've seen it on on the original series and on Voyager. Um and wasn't it neat how when when the female Romulan commander showed up it looked like she had a way to cure the Ponfar. I think what she did was she gave to Shale Romulan drugs that helped her through it. Yeah, she kind of sedated her. Um, and they 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 just made it seem like, and I guess what I interpreted that was that was that she was experiencing it not from her from her own side, but she was experiencing it through her her bond with Stalik. And so um, if she was then sedated that she was kind of just knocked out um, and then was able to live, um, you know, after she came out of it. Uh, but, but Stalag died. We find that yes. out later. Yeah, he, he died, but she was able to live. Um, what, what other ways did you think this fit into Canon or didn't fit into Canon? Yeah. Any, well, uh, well, you know, the, a lot of it just wasn't canon at all. Um, although I think the, the the flashback scenes on Vulcan and the description of of uh, Vulcan culture and things like that um, fit in pretty well with what we've seen, um, like in um, in some of the movies, like in the Search for Spock, and um, in some of the other can. I mean, I guess the literature is not canon, but it has fit in with you know what we've read in the literature. Um, I thought most of it fit in very well, except for what, like what we were saying, the war and the idea of the warranters of the peace, maybe Starfleet and the Federation probably wouldn't have that. Um, but, but a lot of the other stuff, yeah, the way it expanded on Vulcans, with, I mean, I thought she did a pretty good job with that. That was, and, and all of that did fit in very well to what had been established up to that point. Was One thing I noted was interesting is that, uh, and it could be because the book was older, um, the Klingons and the Klingon language are referred to as Klin, K-L-I-N, and, and Romulan as Rom, um, which yes. you don't see often. I think it, it did say in the book, wasn't it at the beginning that, that she did get it from uh, the final reflection, say, oh. saying the word Klin, yet yeah, as a Klingon term, was from the book The Final Reflection. And she does say, use some things from... My Enemy, My Ally by Diane Wayne, some of the Romulan stuff. I thought that was neat. She does kind of borrow a few things. And I like when the writers kind of borrow things from, from each other in these Star Trek books. 
to help tie it all in together. Yeah, I, she did. You're right. She meant, and I'd forgotten that, but at the beginning of the book, she thanks uh, Diane Duane and um, John M. Ford. So obviously she had read those books and, and probably um, picked up some of this stuff from that, which was, which I thought was nice. And also you, using the word to Hyla, which was a Vulcan word that was mentioned in, in, in the novelization for Star Trek, the motion picture. I mean, I mean, I like, that she referred to that as well, using the word to Hyla, which is the Vulcan word for it could be it could mean friend or it could mean lover. And in this case, you know, I think it means friend, just like in, in Star Trek, the motion picture novelization, which was by Gene Roddenberry. They tried to say the word when used for Kirk and Spock means friend or best friend. Yeah, they. I'm. I mean, I was getting the impression that it was more friends here, but again, she. I felt she kind of leaned in the direction of making some sort of romantic relationship between Cleante and Tichel, even though it's not um, obvious and it's not like um, you know we don't really have them in that kind of relationship. But she sort of hinted at it in ways um, which I don't know that I really liked because I. I felt again same way when I was reading motion picture novelization or some of these other books that we've read where they've made a relationship between Kirk and Spock, which I feel like why can't books just explore a deep friendship between two people that is not romantic? It seems like people have a hard time doing that. Yes. Um, yeah. Because there's no reason, you know, that two women can't be very close friends and not have a romantic relationship. But, you know, especially when, uh, Cleante, uh, or not Cleante, when um, Tishale is going through Pond Far, there's even some kind of, uh, you know, hints around that. But it is never, it's not um, anything that's made obvious. So it's, you know, you got to speculating on that. That Yeah, that's what I think. Um, when you're reading the book, it, I think you, if, if you're not really looking for it, you wouldn't really notice any any hints of the two of them. So it's kind of, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that was even intended to be there. <laughs> was it that obvious? It's, it's not that obvious. So, yeah, it's just little things that, that I, yeah, I would I would think that they really are just um, best friends. And Cleante is, is presented in the book as being heterosexual. And to Shale, to Shale, you probably don't know as much. It's just, it's just that Vulcans, you know, always have male-female relationships. She was bonded to a male by her parents when she was a child. Yeah, we just we don't know since she doesn't really talk about her feelings <laughs> yeah. as a Vulcan. Um, but yes, Cleante has had many relationships with men, although she well, that was the other thing too that was interesting. She's had many relationships with men, but she's almost made out to be like a female version of Kirk. Well, as some people imagined Kirk to be, whereas you know a lot of people think of him as a womanizer. I don't I don't know if there's a manizer, but it, Cleante has had many relationships with men, but they're nothing serious. She's, you get the impression that, you know, she kind of herself says that a lot of them don't really mean much. It's just fun for her. Um, it, it's, you know, so she just likes, and she just likes to be in the company of men, um, but it's never anything serious. So in that way, she is kind of like a, a female version of Kirk. Um, and, and so then that makes you think, well, I mean, if, if, if it's never anything serious and she's never been able to form any sort of emotional bond with any of these men, but here she's able to form a, a deep bond uh, with to shale that maybe there is something more there, you know? Um, yes, that's interesting. Yes. And, you know, I wanted to mention the, the cover of the book too, because on, and this is a cover by Bo Boris, Boris Vallejo, who is a very popular uh, artist, cover artist for Star Trek. And there, there are two young women on the cover of this, but I don't think that like the artist was given the uh, the description of the two women for, you know, these because one of these women on the cover is a blonde. And I, the book says they're both brunettes, right? Yes. Um, OK. And, and Cleante is is Egyptian, so um, probably not blonde. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, that's just. Something that, that's and, strange. Yeah, and to shale is described as, as being ugly, too, which is, I, I, I mean, because Vulcans don't really care that much about physical appearance anyway. 
Yeah, and the, well, you can't really tell because the women on the cover of the book also have long hair covering their ears, so you can't tell which one's supposed to be uh, the Vulcan anyway. Right. But, you can, um, yeah, you have to guess which one's which. But they both look, the, the characters on the cover are both, uh, I would say they look pretty. Um, and they have very you know, 80s hair. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the, the <brunette> does. <laughs> um, yeah, so it might be a case of, you know, that, that's not uncommon. There's uh, quite a few Star Trek novels I've read where the cover doesn't really match too well. And so you wonder, you know, maybe, probably the artist maybe didn't get a lot of information. or Right, yeah. We talked about that, like with Home as the Hunter, having different people on the cover that weren't the main characters in the book. And, yeah. Yeah, and the one that bothers me the most is, uh, these, the memory prime, um, which we haven't discussed on, on our podcast, but it's one, one that I really enjoy. Um, and it, whenever I see people online discussing this book, the one thing that bothers me about it is there's this character on the front cover who makes it look like this is the main character, an original character. And you read the book and he's like a blip. He's like a few lines. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this character on the cover? You know, but yeah, it's very strange that they do that, that they do the, the misleading stuff. But anyway, so so how do you think the book um, holds up today? It came out in 1985. Um, you know, like I said, for the, the Vulcan parts, um, that's all fascinating. So if you're someone who is interested in in Vulcan, reading the Vulcan stories and about Vulcan culture, I think it's, it's a good book to read for that. Um, you know... A lot of it that I that I didn't like, you know, the the unnecessary sex scenes and the the, the rape and the you know all this that was very disturbing. Um, and and then the other thing is that I had a hard time, you know, as I said, Kirk and Spock's relationship formed very naturally from working together slowly over time. You know, I had a hard time really understanding the basis of of the friendship between. Cleante and Tishal. It seemed very one-sided. It was, you know, Cleante wanting, hey, I want to know about Vulcans. And yeah, Tishal was curious too. But I, I just found Cleante in the flashbacks, to, to, she, she does mature. I mean, part of it could have been her being young, just not a very likable person and having a hard time understanding how they could form this deep friendship. Now, of course, things probably got sped up for sure when you're in a situation where you're being held hostage and there's no one else around, um, you know, and you're thrown together. Then, of course, you probably are going to form a deeper bond than you would otherwise. Um, but it's, you know, overall, the book had a lot of weird stuff in it. Um, and I don't know that I would recommend it unless, like I said, you you're someone who's interested in, in reading Vulcan stuff, um, in which case those parts are fantastic. Yeah, I think. Um... I think a lot of the book still hold, holds up, really. Um, uh, one one of the things that they kind of said that they messed up on was about Klingons. When they, they said that Klingons age faster than humans, but now it's been established that that they don't. They Klingons actually live a long time, as we've seen, like TOS Klingons on DS9. But but um, aside from that, um, yeah, and that that did come from um, John M. Ford's novel because in that novel that's where we learn that Klingons are supposedly aged you know super fast and you know they're they're an old person by the time they're 30 they're ancient okay yeah um, so, maybe so that's, that's something that from. yeah that's something that got changed in canon although there is one thing in canon that fits with that which is Worf's son Alexander because remember he goes from being like a young child to all of a sudden he's like 20 years old yeah <laughs> like hey wait what happened I mean, so, yeah, it's like the kids grow up faster, and then they, yeah. I guess they slow down aging once they get older. Uh, yeah, that is true, because, Al yeah, Alexander grew up pretty fast. So for anything for for final thoughts or anything about the book, I think that, um, yeah, overall it was a good book, and it was it was good to read about um, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff about Vulcans, like learning about more about the – the, the music, because uh, Tichelle's father was a very well-known musician and, you know, things like that about, about Vulcan society. The, it does bring out a lot of interesting things about the Vulcans. But, of course, the, the book had a lot of disturbing things, too. So I would say, you know, you wouldn't want to read the book if, you're, if your buttons are pushed by this kind of thing. 
because it 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 does get it does get intense. Yes, um, definitely those parts were were difficult to read. Um, and I'll mention one other thing uh, to Shell's mother. We don't the book doesn't talk about her as much because they didn't have a good relationship. But she's one of the Vulcans who is on the uh, Vulcan ship that gets uh, destroyed, um, where Spock, you know, telepathically becomes aware of that. And I've I've already forgotten the name, her her mother's name, and the name of the ship. <laughs> but I did think it was interesting that that was included. Yes, yeah, that that was another nice reference to uh, some of the established canon. Yes. And yeah, and I also thought it was interesting, you know, both of these women um were were not really close to their mother. Um, you know, Cleante was kind of I mean she she was kind of distant from her mother and was glad to get away from her to go to Tling Shar and then and to Shale also what wasn't close to her mother. She was closer to her father than she was to her mother. So that is something interesting. The two of them probably didn't have good uh you know female role models growing up and so now they have have found each other as as friends i just thought that was neat finding other female friends when they didn't really they weren't really close to their mothers yes that's true and you know i didn't think about that too much but yeah cleante's mother was very um self-centered and um you know kind of arrogant, um, but Cleante was a lot like her mother in many ways, so it's kind of like the two of them butting heads because they're very similar personalities, whereas Tichelle really didn't get along with her mother because she was sort of the opposite of her mother. She was more like her father in, in personality, um, kind of a laid-back person, and her mother was more more of a you know forceful, stronger personality, um, but in both cases, they didn't, didn't have good relationships with their mothers, so... I could explain some of it. Okay, so any other um, final thoughts then? Well, I will. I do. I did highlight something <laughs> that uh -huh. I have to. I would have to bring up as a vegan because this bothered me in the story. So there's a scene where um, Cleante and Tichel are on Vulcan and they're picking some vegetables and um, or a fruit and um, they're just talking about this and uh, you know. Uh, Tichelle mentions about the Vulcan diet and whatever, and Cleante said she had tried Vulcan vegetarianism and earned herself a severe case of dysentery. And I thought, man, this author <laughs> doesn't even know what dysentery is, and it was very ignorant, so I had to bring it up. Because dysentery is a disease that is caused by eating contaminated food or water. Um, so it has nothing to do with eating vegetarian stuff, you, you know, um, so I just thought, okay, that's something I definitely need to bring up because. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what does yeah, this sometimes the have to don't, do? Yeah, they don't always <laughs> know everything. Yeah. But um, overall, did you think the book was good or not? Um, I liked it. I, I, I don't know that I, I liked all aspects of it. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was well written. I liked the author and her style of writing, so it wasn't. You know, sometimes when I don't like a book, it takes me a long time to get through it because I feel like I'm forcing myself to read it. And that wasn't the case here at all. I think it was just um, some of the scenes were, as we've mentioned, just disturbing. And um, and that made it maybe, you know, harder to get through in those parts. Um, but but I liked it overall. I, it's not a book that I would say is for everyone, um, but definitely had some really interesting things in it. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. It it was it was a good book because I mean I was um I was I was very into it re reading the whole book. It was it was very you know fast reading to I mean it was easy reading to get through even though and it, I mean it did have the disturbing parts and yeah you, and I, it's so shocking when you see that and you go whoa so yeah it's kind of it it had some shocking stuff and I think if you anybody that doesn't have the stomach for that shouldn't read it. But other than that, I think it, it was a good and, and compelling story. Yeah, I really wish, actually, it would be fantastic. I mean, and um, this author has, as I mentioned, written um, Strangers from the Sky, which is about Vulcans, too. And I think she has a really good grasp on, on Vulcans. And I would love to have seen a story just taking place in this town of Tlingshar and maybe a whole novel just about 
about that and some of the things with uh, touched on in Vulcan. So. Yes, and I yeah I do like um, Margaret Wonder Bonanno because I have read her other books. Yeah, Strangers from the Sky. It was excellent. And has she done any other ones? I think those are the only two that I've read from her. Um, let me see. She did Probe, even though she she says that um she only wrote uh, the original version of Probe and the one that got published. They still had her name on it, but it wasn't really her book because they rewrote it a lot. Oh, I have not read Probe. Oh, it says uh. Catalyst of Sorrows, which I yeah, that's a more either. that's a more modern book, and I haven't read that one either. Oh, that one's from the Lost Air. Okay. Oh wait, and oh I did read that Romulans. one. That's about Romulans. That's right. Catalyst of Shadows was good. I'm thinking it seems like she did write one more recently than that. But yeah, Catalyst of Shadows was good because I know I I read all of those uh, Lost Era books. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu.